Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's event from the Jesus College Intellectual Forum. My name is Julian Huppert, and I'm the director here of the Intellectual Forum. And it's really great to welcome you, whether you are here in person or you're watching us uh, from online, wherever around the world we are. Technology is really amazing to be able to pull in uh, global audiences to these events. Some of you, I'm sure, know Jesus incredibly well. I can see people here who, who know all about it. For others, this may be your first time, so I've got to say a little bit about the history of this amazing place. We were originally set up uh, in 1144 when a group of itinerant nuns were given a small plot of land by Nigel, Bishop of Ely. King Malcolm of Scotland then provided some other land, and we have developed originally as a nunnery and then from 1496 as a originally all-male college, something we've now fixed, uh, as, a, as a center for thinking, of learning, and of course, of amazing architecture from all sorts of different eras, which links into the theme of tonight. And many people from this college have gone to shape thinking around the world to inspire people. One could think of people like uh, Cranmer or Malthus, uh, whose work on population has been so important globally. More recently, we've had people like Lisa Jardine, who is an absolutely brilliant and inspirational expert, both in Renaissance English and as chair of the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority, and really made a, an immense difference in science and policy, uh, as well as research. Most recently, some of you may know Clean Bandit. Some of you know Clean Bandit, Rockabye. I'm glad there's some nods here, uh, but the, the band formed here at Jesus College, and there have been many, many others over the time. So we have a very, very long history, and the Intellectual Forum was set up a few years ago to reach out beyond the boundaries of this college and to get people to think and talk about some of the biggest issues that face us. And that's really the spirit of what we have here today. Because here in the college, we've been joined for a number of months. We have a number of more months uh, of having her around by a truly inspirational person. And it's been wonderful to see uh, Yasmin Lari around uh, wherever one walks, over the coffee, over lunch, when we're having you know broccoli, fish, whatever it is, Yasmin has been there inspiring, challenging, and fascinating people, fellows, staff, students, outsiders, everybody, because she is one of these people who has really made her own way and changed the way people act and think. I'm not going to go through everything that she's done. You can see a very, very short list of things here, but she was uh, Pakistan's first female architect, trained in the UK and went back there doing what I think she's called starchitecture, architecture for people with absolute trolley loads of money. And then after a while, doing some amazing, I think, brutalist buildings, decided there were other things that one could do to help people on a much larger scale. And that's what we're going to hear about today, the barefoot architecture. How do we use very basic, cheap, environmentally sustainable tools to actually build on a large scale for people? Um, so it's been great have it, having uh, Yasmin here as the Sir Arthur Marshall uh, Visiting Fellow. She's here for the whole year. But I should give you a warning before I actually let her speak which is that she has a very dangerous habit of persuading people to go to Pakistan and help her with everything that she does. And so if you're nervous about that, you should be pre-warned now before she speaks. Otherwise, it has been an immense pleasure to have you here in Jesus for the month so far. Thank you so much for coming to give this talk. I so look forward to hearing from you. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much, Julian for this very you know, very kind of engaging description and, and introduction. So um, I bring to you greetings from Pakistan, all of you here and also in the virtual uh, space uh, and, and all of the friends who are joining us, uh, you know, everywhere else as well. So thank you for being here this evening, all of you, because uh, so many of you braving the winter cold, I don't know how it is outside, but must be really cold. Uh, and you know that uh, basically uh, we have really come and we'll be discussing the reality of climate change, even though the disaster has occurred several thousands of kilometers away in remote Pakistan. I don't know how many of you know about Pakistan. So uh, I'm grateful to Director Julian and the Intellectual Forum's wonderful team. There's Charlotte and Georgia and also Mark somewhere up there who have been organizing this event's, uh, evening's event. And what a pleasure and, and uh, really a joy to be here at Jesus. So thank you all for being here today. So ever since I've arrived in Cambridge at the beginning of the first term, Julian has provided so much support for which I'm really most grateful. Thank you so much, Julian. So how many, I believe there are lots of students here. Who are the ones, can we identify them? Uh, 
Any raising of hands where you are, you guys? Okay, all right, that's lovely. All right. Yeah, I never thought the students come to these things, but that's nice to know then. So, <laughs> so as you will see, I will be presenting my vision of building sustainable eco communities in the aftermath of the last year's devastating floods in Pakistan. For the program targeting 1 million households at a time that I have developed is beholden to the advice and effort of so many friends and colleagues here at Cambridge, and of course, at Heritage Foundation of Pakistan. There's some here, and I see some friends here as well. So, you know, all of you, thank you so much for, for being there for me. So, uh, as you can see, it's a not-for-profit social and cultural entrepreneur organization uh, formed in 1980 for safeguarding Pakistan's cultural heritage. But since 2005, it provides humanitarian assistance by linking heritage to, to really innovative social and, and eco-led initiatives. We try to bring both of them together somehow, and that is my effort to do that. Um, now, uh, tonight, I would like to introduce you to my country, along with sharing my journey towards sustainable architecture and green design. Uh, it will be in three parts. First, Pakistan's strength and challenges. Secondly, application of Baza, the barefoot social architecture that Julian referred to. And then the Pakistan floods. And how do you build these sustainable eco communities? So uh, Pakistan is custodian of diverse heritage. As you will see here, there's the tangible heritage, the intangible heritage, and also vernacular heritage. So uh, it has a rich collection of, of uh, all these wonderful monuments and sites that begin with Bronze Age World Heritage Mohenjo-Daro, Hindu, Buddhist, and Sikh remains during the centuries preceding 14th centuries, Sultanate period sites such as Makli World Heritage, then 16th century Mughal forts and palaces and paradisal gardens, and a shared heritage, of course, with the British colonial period, which we have uh, in all our cities, and it really has shaped the, the urban centers in, in my country. And then, of course, they all lend a diversity to our cultural legacy that is not found in many countries. And then, of course, there's an intangible heritage that has shaped the lives of our people. That is all-pervading and includes Sufi traditions and spiritualism, folklore and folk traditions, oral history, and diverse crafts, many still being practiced by rural women that have been passed on to them from generation to generation. It's amazing how much they're able to do even today. And then the vernacular heritage, which is not often mentioned, but is very much there. And this is where I've learned the use of sustainable materials, local sourcing, ease of handling, economical in use, and one that is based on age-old local wisdoms. You mustn't forget, really, that there is so much that exists in every country and is, by and large, not used very much or has been, by and large, forgotten. So, also, if you see, we have lots of social justice issues. As in many parts of the world, Pakistan suffers from a host of social justice problems. It is listed 161 out of 191 in Human Development Index, so we're really, really low down. And is also lagging behind in achieving the SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals that everybody now should be trying to aim for. And then also, Pakistan is a highly vulnerable country in terms of climate change. We can see from 2005, almost every year, we've had one disaster or the other, because most of it is situated on fault lines and in the path of melting glaciers. As you see in the list, as a result of climate change, we've suffered from recurring disasters uh, constantly, really. And then I thought I'd show you something that I'm not very proud of anymore that you didn't did mention. Uh, so it is ironic that even though belonging to the third world, during 36 years of private practice, barring a few projects, I had indulged in an extravagant egotistic journey which focused on, on serving the elite of my country. I've done this in the past, such as the head office for Pakistan State Oil at the time of Fortune 500 listed building an FTC or Finance and Trade Center, the largest building in Pakistan at the time it was designed in the early 1980s. Um, once I was being interviewed by Oliver Wainwright and I, he was discussing with me how he's doing what I'm doing now. And I think he put a headline, headline saying, I'm atoning for what I did before. And that's precisely what I'm doing actually. So, <laughs> all right. So then we have this earthquake that happened in 2005. And that really changed the course of my life completely. And the other disasters that have forced my attention towards the vast marginalized sections of my country, I really didn't know much about it, I have to say. 
the highly destructive 7.6 Richter scale earthquake claimed over 70,000 lives and displaced 400,000 families. It was a major, major disaster, but nothing like what's happened now in this last year. So then at the time, uh, uh, since then, there, there have been really, you know, so many disasters that Pakistan has been subjected to the international colonial charity model. I call it that because this is really something that is done in all countries that go through this disaster, especially the ones who belong to the global south. And that's robbed people of uh, self-esteem and rendered them dependent on the others. The distribution of handouts made perfectly able people into supp supplicants who no longer believed in their own capacity for productive work. They made them really totally dependent. And so you can see that charity, although in good faith, uh, fosters dependency and robs the receiver of self-esteem. Promotion of alien imagery and expensive materials, that's what is being promoted, cannot be replicated by the poor, culturally and environmentally, it's extremely damaging. And then lack of appropriate knowledge. Internationals who had come in had no idea what was needed in the country on what the poor or the uh, rural areas needed. And so uh, there's only limited assistance that they could provide to the needy. And then another very, you know, what I feel is very kind of negative impact was that women were not even considered. They were invariably left behind, even though worse sufferers were, they were doing the disasters. So they were never, never really taken care of. High administrative cost of disbursement of, or of aid allows only a fraction to reach affected households. So these were the drawbacks in the system that still exist actually and still not been modified. So it was also during these disasters and some of you who worked in international agencies, you, you know that UN cluster or silo system has been promoted in all these areas. And that means that you only pick a few things to do. Every agency has their own pet sort of topics or they've got their own agendas and they only will do only one or the other. For instance, one will do housing, the other one will do water, the third one will do plantation and so on and so forth. So we have to be very careful because and engineers also actually mustn't forget. Robert, you're here, so you know, yeah, it's uh, they have to be very careful also. So we have to see what is the impact that we are uh, actually inflicting and how we are now, uh, you know, hurting the planet actually. So you can see that there's steel and with Portland cement, there's very high energy consumption, and we have to be all careful as to how we now use uh, these materials. And there must be now alternative materials to be used. And so uh, at that time, what is interesting is that. Uh, Donor fatigue set in after the 2010 floods, and suddenly the targets could not be met. And that's the time when IOM, which is the International Organization for Migration, that decided to use local sustainable model of earth, lime, and bamboo that I was promoting at the time. And nobody had thought of you, of asking me to do anything unless this, you know, the the funding was was restricted. And then uh, it was something that could be could be done. At that time, we managed to build something like 40,000 of these units. And it became the largest uh, you know, shelter program, zero carbon shelter program in the world. So uh, this is, I thought I'll just show you as an introduction. And now we come to Barefoot Social Architecture of Baza. Now from 2005, as I mentioned, it has been the interaction with poverty stricken vulnerable population that has forced me to dispense with my hugely inflated ego that as all architects do, uh, and obligating me to swallow the bitter pill of humility by sitting at the threshold of the poor exploring their age-old practices. The first time I could do in my life. Learning from Pakistan's pre-industrial vernacular heritage, I understood that design is not a shared alone activity, a sad standalone activity. It must be underpinned by considerations of social impact and ecological sustainability. As I moved forward on a divergent path from the one that I had been trained for, uh, the question uppermost in my mind has been, how can architects play a role in mending imbalances by stitching the highly damaged earth tapestry? Today, what we design, we must be very mindful as to what we are doing. And above all, how can architectural design transform women's lives? Has anybody ever thought of that? Something you might start thinking about. Uh, that, and, and also give them pride, agency, and identity. In countries like mine, uh, women do not have much of a say. And I think this is one of the things, one of the missions I have in my life to be able to do that. So we need to design uh, elements that would uh, uh, have the unmet, the, the, fulfill the unmet needs of those at the bottom of the pyramid. At the same time, design climate smart, sustainable structures that resonate with their own cultural norms. We can't impose anything on people. 
we have to see where they're coming from, what their traditions are, and we mustn't violate that trust that they have when you go and help them. So uh, I thought I'd show you this slide, Barefoot in Pakistan. Now, because of widespread deficits and deprivations, particularly among women, for me, the pursuit for justice has been paramount. I felt compelled to find architectural solutions that provide both social and ecological justice. I do not believe that we have to sacrifice the search for justice of one kind at the cost of the other. We need to be working at both ends. And the reason for designing a stratagem called Barefoot Social Architecture or BASA for the disadvantaged was because I felt empathy with those who walked barefoot and had become my fellow travelers. So I was working with them now and I had to be like them and think like them. So what is BASA? BASA is uh, almost, it's really uh, about social engineering to bring about social change among those living on the margins incorporating environmental, cultural and technical attributes. It is designed to enable communities to rise from a cycle of dependence to a culture of pride and self-reliance. This is the key to, the, to everything that we do in a community. And then uh, if you look at the different attributes, so one is maximizing the potential of existing barefoot ecosystem, uh, applying uh, you know, three zeros, zero cost to donor, zero carbon, zero waste methodologies that lead to zero poverty. Secondly, focus on social and ecological justice, as I said, through humanistic architecture, uh, fostering pride and dignity, preventing depletion of the planet's resources. And uh, architects who are here or students who are here, you must know that you have to change the way you design when you work with the poor. You cannot carry on the way that you've been taught what, as, a, as a star architect or you know, one who becomes a prima donna. So we have to be very careful. And then the third is delivery of unmet needs to barefoot entrepreneurs or Bees by training in the production of affordable products with particular focus on women. Everything that I do today, I have to make sure that somehow it helps women to rise above whatever their, their condition might be. And fourth is design of low tech, low impact, non-engineered structures for shrinking the ecological footprint in construction using green skills and sustainable locally sourced materials. That is the key to everything. If you have to bring materials from outside or from distances, then you have so much embodied energy. And so what we have to do is to see what is around us, what is available easily, what can be sourced easily. And that's what we use. So um, now I just thought I'd show you that uh, within a few years, we were able to uh, benefit about 0.84 million people. And that's about over 100,000 per year through our zero carbon rights-based development. And it aims to achieve 12 out of 17 sustainable development goals at a very, very low cost, I might say. This approach has allowed me to adopt a bottoms up approach, encouraging efficient use of funds and resources, rights-based development, knowledge sharing through training and guidance for cost-effective output. So everything you do, you have to make sure that it's economical, it's affordable, it can be useful to the poor that we are working for. Now, um, so I just thought I'll bring to you this, uh, my barefoot ecosystem. It's not very much talked about nor discussed. So the deprivations that I've referred to are part of a disparate, parallel, all-pervading world of a dormant barefoot ecosystem, which has been overlooked by economists and politicians alike. Nobody talks about the poor, and I'm sure poverty is everywhere. And bamboo is, again, another material that's quite amazing. I don't know how many of you have ever used bamboo. Anybody? Well, yeah, you have. That's good then. We must talk about it afterwards. Huh? So that's, that's, that's excellent. Because, you know, <laughs> until I started using bamboo, I never paid any attention to it. But in 2009, I was forced to use it because there was no other material available. And since then, I have not looked back. It's just incredible what bamboo can do. And I wish you'd grow more here. There's very, not much is grown in, 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 in the UK for some reason. But I think this all should be now changed somehow because I think it'd be a good idea for us to concentrate on materials that are, that are you know, uh, basically they're just available so easily. So uh, then now, let's see now, I thought I'll give you some examples of what I call my uh, humanistic architecture. So these are self-built zero carbon houses. And you can see that they are, they're just uh, lime and earth blocks and uh, uh, rendered with lime and earth. And then the, the roofs are all bamboo and they have survived pretty well. And then, uh, there's some more, which I, since I learn a lot from tradition, so this is what I call neo, neo vernacular, basing on uh, forms and 
uh, techniques that I, I found in in, uh, in in synth, for instance, in the in the south, and uh, uh, you know, trying to build in areas where there'll be flooding, so you 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 innovate on that. And then this is another one where you have cross bracing. I believe cross bracing we use uh, even in Europe, and I think also in in the UK, but it's not been used very much now. Uh, what our innovation has been to use bamboo rather than wood, and that's given us a very very good, very strong structures actually. And then uh, I thought I'd show you this if I can just uh, make it work. There's a this is really in areas where there's flooding, and uh, so you can do it all on stilts. And Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera did this uh, animation, and you can see the water rises, and then everybody who's on the upper level is safe. So we, as architects, we know that we can design for really some of the worst eventualities. So, uh, and then I thought I'll show you this as well. Uh, this is a, uh, let's see, it's a floating structure, if I can make it work. I don't seem to be able to, oh, okay. So this is again, very simply done. It's again, a bamboo. Uh, it's not starting. Oh, well. Oh, yeah, okay. So it's, it's a time-lapse video. And uh, uh, it's, it's very simply done where you, you, again, you know, there's hardly any kind of equipment. Uh, uh, the bamboo is cut and put into that particular form. And uh, uh, it can be done, you know, in less than a day, you could put up a structure. But what's important about floating structures is that in places like Pakistan, for instance, where there's so much flooding, and I might just inform you that more than 50% of all disasters worldwide are, are, are water related. So we all have to be working towards finding solutions, what happens when the waters rise. And uh, so this kind of uh, uh, arrangement would be good, uh, maybe not even on a permanent basis, but at least you know whenever the, they could be there as kind of rescue uh, uh, kind of elements, which can be then used whenever something like that happened. So, uh, okay, so let's, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, and then this is uh, something that I wanted to show you because this really is uh, um, made, made with prefabricated panels. And that's, uh, it, it's something that I'm using a lot now, which is bamboo, but you make prefab panels in a, in a workplace where you can control the quality. And then you're putting it all together and you make it into octagon and it becomes a, and it becomes a room. And uh, uh, this is the one that now we are promoting a lot in the flood area because it has been very, very strong. If you add on more of those panels, because it's all modular, you can make it into a classroom, which is about 17 foot, foot by 12 feet. And then if you like, you can add on some more and you put a dome over it. And then, you know, you get a kind of a, 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 a kind of community center. And I thought I'll just show you what it might look like. This was built in uh, in Muckley in 2019. And then it's the same bamboo panels that have made this kind of structure with bamboo trusses. And uh, this really is a, is a training and a, and, a, a, and a conference center. So that's where we had a conference and about Pakistan conference in 2019. We had lots of guests from Pakistan and from abroad and they all stayed there and also uh, participated in this workshop. And then I thought I'll just show you the same, uh, the same center that doubles up as a workplace for, for the poor to come and learn and to be trained and then carry on. So uh, I just thought as a background, I might just show this to you. So now we come to the last part of my presentation, which is building sustainable eco communities. Then I just thought I'll show you this slide, which is my most celebrated barefoot entrepreneur. Her name is Champa and uh, she's a millionaire. And uh, she uh, did this uh, uh, earth, earthen flat with earthen platform, this particular store. It was actually built in Grandview Square just uh, last year in May. And uh, she, she uh, uh, you know, she taught something like 40,000 housewives how to build the store. And she earned so much money that she now really is sort of loaded with her jewelry and everything. And she says, well, I want it from the true love of the source. So this is what I want. I think there can be many millionaires if we talk of the barefoot ecosystem and we try to see how we can make them rise. And then I thought I'd show you the Pune village and my, my pilot, uh, the Film Plus provided the opportunity to implement a holistic pilot of 1,000 households designed around uh, participatory, community-driven, women-led approaches. The model incorporates, uh, you know, basically Baza tenants, which ensure that unmet needs of the poor are catered for, and the least carbon footprint by using locally 
source of sustainable materials are used. And so um, this I thought I'd show you what is what is what does it compose of the sort of holistic model. So one of the right is development to provide unmet needs of the people who lost everything, literally. And then secondly, flood mitigation measures, a, a combination of community forests, aquifer wells, and earthen walls. Thirdly, improved uh, food security, because that's also something that's very critical now. There's a lot of hunger in the area because everything has got wiped out, and even there are no fields, and there's nothing, is, nothing has grown for some time. So that's very important. And then we have to have livelihoods for everybody. So there are all these four major components that we tried to put in and have built into this pilot and that has, seems to have worked because we find that people are fending for themselves now. So communities are engaged in local planning and decision making for service delivery by vendors for various supplies. Women-led initiatives have helped regenerate local economy by fabricating barefoot products which also fulfill many of the unmet needs of marginalized and displaced families. Utilizing their own skills and training, they are teaching and learning from each other to improve, improve their own quality of life. And that's amazing that what we're seeing now, the cooperation among communities, cooperation among, among, among various villages, on the, how they're helping each other in terms of training also. So uh, I just thought very quickly, I'll just run through. Uh, these are the basic, uh, what I call the rice based uh, needs, unmet needs, which is the, uh, you know, at least one room, uh, one safe room, a toilet, uh, water, solar light, and a, a, a clean cooking place like the stove. And uh, this I thought I'll show you how the structure actually works. This is the prefab panel that I showed you earlier. And uh, the, you can do it, assemble it in two hours. And then the family itself put the, puts the matting around the, the, the particular skeleton, and then they beautify it and, and make it into a real kind of, you know, solid pakka house. And this is what's what's been done with, you know, this is what participatory approach really means. And then they also have uh, toilets now and light and solar light and also hand pumps, et cetera. And then I thought I'll just show you, this is not a very good uh, sketch, not, not it's just, I just thought I'll put it in because this is something that I, I, we're trying to do is to see how we protect from floods. So on the left, you see a, a kind of an aquifer trench, like, a, like there used to be moats, really it's a, it's a flood moat and then uh, masonry walls and plantation of bamboo and then forest and so on. So you have lots of barriers. And the important thing is how do you soak water into the soil? Rather than you know, being affected by it, if you can do that, then it'll make the land also much more fertile. And this has been my experience in, in the work that I have done. So that's going on. And these are the various elements. I won't go into them in detail, uh, but you can see they're all platforms and. Uh, even kitchen gardens are being being placed on on uh, on raised platforms, and then livelihoods. So here again, we have to make sure that they all have something, some food item that they can have control over themselves. And so we can see that you know uh, there's lots of uh, there's orchards and kitchen gardens, poultry and eggs, fish farming, and milk and cheese. So at least the basic food items are becoming available by their own effort. And so uh, then there are these enterprises, which again, I said, they're barefoot enterprises. They're all uh, materials and, and products that can be used in the construction that is, that is being done around them. And they're all you know, items of daily use. So they're selling among themselves. They are not bothering to go anywhere. They don't have to go anywhere else because there's enough market around them. And then uh, this is the, the village and the cluster in the 13 villages that have formed this 1,000 Unit. I thought I'll show you very quickly how that 1,000 unit uh, uh, concept is is can be taken up to now create one million uh, settlements or, or or household settlements. So you can see this that uh, what I've designed is to see that uh, there could be five of these 1,000 household each village clusters, which will make into a hub. And then it is a, we set up. It's a decentralized arrangement. So where each hub of uh, which is of five village clusters uh, is able to take on the production of components for all 5,000 villages. And each center cluster is production. So, you know, everything starts being done there. And it houses trained, trained artisans consisting of various categories of people who belong to the villages and are able to help in self-building. And, and so uh, this is a, a map to show you or what we worked out is to see how those hubs could be, could be actually distributed all around this province of Sindh. 
and uh, uh, how everyone once they start uh, working independently, then of course uh, any agencies or any organizations can take on any number of hubs and carry on themselves, while we only provide guidance and we provide the trained people that are needed. And so uh, there are figures to show you how I think we can build one million in about you know about two years. And uh, uh, another slide is to work out you won't need more than maybe a couple of hundred thousand dollars to even do that. Although now I think Pakistan is being given so much aid, it seems to me that, you know, I think they're saying it'll be five times this that'll be needed uh, because everybody's now thinking of going into, you know, concrete and burn brick and so on. And that is where the danger is. So I just thought just to show you that uh, uh, how affordable and how, you know, uh, with a participatory approach, how quickly everything can, could be done. And so uh, now I'll, I'll also share with you very quickly. I don't know how we're doing for time, Julian. Is that okay? All right. So then uh, we've just launched this program because as Julian said, I want everybody to come to Pakistan. So we have this uh, program called the Climate Volunteers, uh, which has just been, I think some of you might have received it or maybe you've signed up. And uh, we had a a bunch of students come in from Vienna Technical University who came and stayed for a week and they actually built the school, uh, the first one that could be built in, the, in, in that area. And now there are lots of children that are attending it, as you can see on the left. Uh, this is again, the same prefab panel that is used. And I think they put up in about three days. The finishing might have taken a bit longer, but that's all that was needed. And then just to show you, to encourage you that things are not so bad, uh, this is the kind of accommodation that we have for our for our volunteers. It's in the village and the village, villages will host everybody. And I'm hoping that at least two batches might come, uh, you know, uh, in the, during the vacation uh, in, the, in the month of uh, end of March and, 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 and then April, of course. And then uh, this is something that they did. Let me see if this opens, just to show you what an echo uh, living condition could be. So this is where they stayed and it's got a, a bathroom, which is an echo toilet, so it's a compost toilet. And uh, once you get used to it, it's not so bad. Yeah, because yeah, but I think I think possibly you know there's sometimes people are a little bit hesitant. So uh, so you can see that uh, that you know uh, it's perfectly okay and perfectly livable, or we can design in a manner that you know even if you use the humblest of materials, the least expensive materials, you can still create uh, livable conditions. And that's what architects have to do. I mean, this is what we are trained for. If we don't do it, then, you know, what can I say? Um, all right. So uh, this is my slide for Baza giving. Uh, as you see, see, I'd like to see another kind of mercy, another humanitarian model to help the millions that are still destitute. A uh, more direct way of helping, perhaps a more humanistic way of, uh, of uh, becoming engaged is now needed, not just giving away money and clearing your own conscience saying everything is okay because I think it's now the time has come in the world to be a little bit more engaged with each other. And so uh, I would like that, you know, it could be like adoption or something or sending uh, gifts in kind. I'm very much against sending funds and money, uh, but I think gifts and, and, and spending, sending, uh, you know, whatever items in, in kind is perfectly okay. So, and I would also like to see a barefoot knowledge network developed for all of us to share our experience and also focus on climate smart trainings for all of us to be prepared. I mean, I think this time has come for all of us to collaborate as to what happens when a disaster such as the one that we've experienced strikes. And because we don't know where the next disaster would be, it could be anywhere. Uh, climate change is very unpredictable. So we'll have to see. And I'm hoping that uh, when the students go there, they will be able to do some research. I'm hoping more people will come to do research there as well, not just come there for a visit, but go there and see, look at the conditions, look at the, the way the water flows, look at what, you know, what kind of agriculture is now is not to be taken up. And it, there's so many ways by which we can probably store water. And, and so we need, at this time, Pakistan needs a lot of intellectual help, a lot of uh, I think a lot of inputs to say how we should deal with such things. But I think those, whatever experiments we do in Pakistan will be useful elsewhere as well. Because it's not only Pakistan, it could be anywhere, as I said, anywhere in the world that could be hit by the same kind of disaster. So just to remind you, um, zero cost, zero carbon, zero waste for saving the planet that will lead to zero poverty. And I just thought if I, if this click, this thing works, uh, maybe it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Not to worry, this is about Vienna. 
So there'll be, if you want to see more of it, then Vienna is going to be hosting an exhibition next month on this kind of work. So thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, very kind. Well, thank you very much, Yasmin, for, for so much. I, I love that vision there. Uh, you know, and if we could achieve all of that, that would obviously be fantastic. Um, we do have time for some questions. So if you do have a question in the room, if you just put your hand up, then our team with the microphones will come around and get to you. Um, if you can work out whether that's a real hand or a hesitant one, there's, there's one just back there. You want to hold it? <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, so I have a question regarding scalability and the, the plan to integrate to community services like water treatment. So you have this example of echo toilets, but given these large clusters, would there be a compatibility between Baza and something like water treatment or getting running water to all of these uh, Baza built homes? Yes. Uh, uh, am I ready to pick up the microphone? Yeah, I think it's a it's a very pertinent question what you ask because uh, scalability is always an issue, uh, and how do you really able to deal with everything? The problem is there's not enough water to have a water supply first of all, so the water is limited. And that means that we don't have to deal with huge uh, you know quantities of water. Secondly, um, uh, echo toilets work perfectly well if we can get the communities to learn how to make compost. So it does mean removal of the solid waste. It does mean you know to have to treat it. But it is done because that's what we are doing. And uh, uh, I've, I've uh, all these um, groups and, and trained villagers who go around telling people what to do, train them. And then we also have audit committees now to go and see what's going on. So as long as you don't try to do a kind of a consolidated a kind of supervision and, and you know make it all centralized, if you can break it up into segments and you do it through at a village level, then it all starts happening. But that does mean bringing the community up to a certain level. But you'd be surprised how quickly they rise up to it. So, thank you. There's a question up on that side there. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Mona Zogby from Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, CISL. There's actually a group of us here. Um, I have two very quick questions. The first is you, you started your talk mentioning that um, Pakistan is very prone to natural disasters. So I'm just wondering, how do you make sure that these structures are resilient to disasters? I mean, you mentioned doing the platforms and so on, but how do you make sure that for the longer term, they're resilient to protect lives, but also to sustain? And the second one very quickly is about, I'm just wondering to what extent, um, with, uh, to what extent are these structures and these solutions localized and context specific? For example, might we see such structures and solutions being applied in the global north from a need, but also from a cultural acceptance perspective. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah. Difficult questions to answer, but let me try. First of all, um, uh, we've tested the resilience of these structures, and uh, I should have put a couple of slides in where we uh, built something in 2014, and that area got totally submerged. There was water standing there for two months, and then by the time water receded, photographed, and everything was safe. So there are Although I call them uh, non-engineered, but they are properly engineered in the sense that everything is anchored. And as you must know about disasters, everything might be connected to each other. So every element is connected to the other. So the whole thing really moves. And bamboo is very good with this way. It allows it to move. And then you know, it's back again. So they've survived pretty well. This has been an experience. Uh, and bamboo does last extremely well, actually. I mean, I found in... Japan in, uh, in Komamoto Castle, uh, there was 400 year old buildings and bamboo was still surviving. So we can be assured that if we take care of it, bamboo is, is a really good material. And secondly, I'm sorry, what was the second question you said? Uh, sorry. Uh, it was mostly about how, to what extent it's context specific, these solutions and whether we can see them in other contexts. You know, I hate to talk about universal solutions, but I don't think there are any. I think we have to learn the principles and then see what is good for your own context and you have to design accordingly. And that's why I think awareness is the most important thing. First of all, to know that other, there are other alternatives, there are other ways of doing uh, things and also other ways of practicing architecture. Finally, you'll have to see where you are, what your context is and what the conditions are. And then you have to design your own. 
you can certainly look at principles. I mean, all over the world work is going on and there's lots of very good work. So we need to see what is applicable to us. You're, you're architectural students, are you? Oh, sorry. You wanna, sorry, which department was that? Sustainability, okay, very good one. That's very, very much related, yeah, okay. Please promote bamboo, okay? <laughs> so we, we've had some questions come in from online and, and please do put them in using the Q&A feature uh, if you'd like to. And one of them actually follows on uh, quite a bit from that, from Andy C. Uh, it would be great to hear some thoughts on applying this to European context, but particularly in Ukraine, where there's obviously a huge rebuilding project. So, so do you have any thoughts specifically on the Ukrainian situation? Well, you know, I'm not familiar with the condition in Ukraine. I don't know what materials there are, but certainly there are solutions which are very expensive, uh, which have been promoted by IKEA, for instance. Uh, but there are these uh, very quickly built uh, kind of pre-packed, uh, prefab kind of units that can be brought in and you can put together. But I do think that we have to look for solutions because, you know, there's so much of, uh, of uh, the climate migrants, there are conflict-ridden migrants. I mean, there are migrants all over the world today. And there are, there are people who are homeless, there are people who are living under bridges. Well, we have to find a solution for them. They can't be left as they are. The intents are not the answer. So everywhere we have to see what materials there are and then design accordingly. Why aren't we prepared for all this? Why don't we have these things ready? So when it happens, we know that we can roll them out. So I think all of us need to start working on these issues. Only then we'll be able to you know, really serve uh, humanity, if you like. Thank you. So there is a question here. Thank you uh, very much for this wonderful talk. I'm uh, curious, as you've talked about barefoot knowledge and knowledge transfer, and you're talking about kind of the change in Pakistan over time with, with climate adaptation and, and the like, what have you noticed or what has perhaps been inspiring with intergenerational knowledge transfer? Has there been anything interesting that's emerged from young people that you've been working with um, in terms of new ideas for sustainable buildings, for climate resilience and adaptation? Curious what you've noticed in, in that kind of generational space. Well, you know, I, I don't know about Pakistan so much, but younger people are certainly more receptive to what I'm saying. Older generations don't think this important because I think they're busy with their own practices. What is the young architects and others who really want to, who, who understand the, the, you know, the damage that's being caused with whatever we are doing. And so my audience really largely is young people. Uh, but in, in Pakistan also, I think it's really the, the university students who are listening to me, but they, the problem is that young people don't get an opportunity to, to practice all this. I mean, that's the biggest issue actually. Even if they want to, how do we do it? And that's what I'm hoping that maybe some universities can get together and try to work out how we can make it happen. We must do that, you know, otherwise, you know, how will you do it? Right? There's a question right at the back. I just want to take the space to fill this room with some Urdu before I dive in and I'll translate to English because I think a Muslim woman standing here is a beautiful thing to see for myself as well. So, you have given this presentation that our entire world is large in it. So, the presentation you have given seems like the climate anxiety that we all as young people especially feel all of the indigenous feminist future you know, I see a lot of future in your work. It seems like there's a lot of solutions already present in that knowledge, like you mentioned in indigenous knowledge. So we as a Western kind of mindset have this habit of knowledge extraction. We go to these countries, like you said, in Baza enterprise is a very different way of uh, engaging with knowledge. But we go and inshallah we'll go again to these places. How do you advise us to interact with the knowledge and the technology there? to make sure that we don't produce the same harm that knowledge extraction in colonialist scientific spheres to propagate. So like just what kind of advice you have for people going there? Well, I'm hoping that, you know, some of you will be coming there and, and see what could be done. Uh, I think the Global North has, has quite a depository of, uh, of technology and other kinds of knowledge that maybe might be missing in countries like mine. And I would very much like an exchange of a kind where people are able to advise and see what they are able to contribute towards problems like what we have in the global south. And I think young people like yourselves, if you go back, especially because you belong to Pakistan, you go back and see what you've learned here and go and contribute there to see how we can do things better. And finally, all of us have to try to do things better, right? So I hope that you, know, you do that and your colleagues who might go back. 
Can I do another question from online? Um, uh, so you, it's 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 somebody anonymous attendee who seems to come to a lot of our talks. Um, thank you for the for the brilliant talk. Um, you said students were welcome to come and help. Uh, I, I'm not a student, and I'm probably not going to go to Pakistan, but I would like to help. What can I do? Oh, that's a that's a very difficult question. <laughs> uh, I don't think everybody has to go there. I think there's a lot of potential in technology, and uh, I mean, it, it depends what his interest. I mean, is it? Anonymous, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever the interest might be, listen, we need a lot of uh, help in terms of maybe um, bringing literacy levels a little bit higher. We need a lot of help in trying to see what could be done with uh, technology in terms of health. I mean, there can be many ways by which people from here can advise as to what could be done, because you do have the tools here that you have developed. And uh, somehow, if it could be you know, transferred in some way, uh, it could be done. So I would very much like actually if we can create a kind of a, a kind of online forum of some kind where uh, you know we could uh, we could really be discussing these issues. Also, as I said, you know, there's a problem about agriculture. There's a problem who are the people who know what to grow when there's a standing water for four months. There must be some expert somewhere. And you know, if we can get hold or, or get advice from those, that would be really something valuable. So lots of issues, I think we think about it. So certainly if you're away, it doesn't matter, you can still contribute. Yeah, and we had, we had a talk in this room about a week ago, I think, which looked at the Fenland farming, where there's some. Now what we've been hearing about is uh, various new modern methods of construction. So I thought for the next question, I might have somebody who knows a bit about that. <laughs> well, firstly, um, Yasmin, congratulations on a, on a really wonderful, wonderful talk. We're very fortunate in Cambridge to have you as a visiting Sir Arthur Marshall visiting professor. I just wanted to, to make a comment about resilience uh, that was uh, raised earlier in an earlier question, that the another huge advantage of bamboo is resilience against earthquakes, as I'm sure you will know, but it's a, there's a tremendous loss of life from earthquakes, mainly from brick structures, which are brittle and, and very um, unresilient to earthquakes, but your bamboo structures are brilliant in that respect as well. And, and I guess, I mean, you focus very much on, on the Great Deluge and on flooding, but presumably in, there will be another big earthquake inevitably, and then there'll be a tremendous um, opportunity to, to create your bamboo structures to, to minimize loss of life from earthquakes. Well, you're absolutely right. You hit the thing, as they said, nail on the on the head, because uh, um, bamboo is quite remarkable when we talk of uh, movement of you know the, the earth, the earth moving, and how it does survive it. And I didn't show it to you, but I've actually got a model that I did, and we got it tested on a shaking table test, and uh, they simulated the movement of the Kobe earthquake, seven point three Richter scale, and they did it up to. Uh, uh, up to first up to 100%, 200%, 275%. And then the vice chancellor who's watching the university, he, he said, well, let's break it to 670%. And um, the structure, uh, it, it uh, warped, but it did not collapse. So there's life safety. So what you say is so right. It's not, not the disasters that kill people. It's really the buildings that kill people. Because as you rightly say, when there's a brick structure that collapses or there's a concrete beam that falls on your head, well, you've got no chance if a bamboo structure does collapse, and I don't think it will, if it does, it won't hurt you. So we have to be really mindful how we design now. We have to have big structures really lighter. And this, this way you also save material. I mean, there's lots of issues that are, in terms of circular economy, that are important for us to be thinking about. We could bring it all together and, and do it that way. You know, the, that's, but, but yeah, I think, I think maybe you're the one who should be starting more, more stuff on, on bamboo. <laughs> <That's the> <laughs> There's a question just behind. Thank you so much for your presentation. You talked a lot about women and how your architecture and your structures uplift women or how you're paying particular attention to that. Can you give some examples or just explain a little bit if that's aesthetically or by training women or in the function of the buildings? I would love to hear more. Okay, I'm glad you focus on women because I think it's so important and people just ignore that. And so, uh, yes, I mean, there are many ways you can help uh, in bringing in uplifting women, but design also can do a lot. First of all, I think um, 
uh, whatever I'm doing, it's the back of my mind, it is how do I provide dignity for women? So for instance, I designed this particular stove, which is called the Pakistan Chula that I showed with, uh, we had this amazing woman who's our icon. Uh, it's, it's, I, what I did was to give them a platform. I did it mainly because of the flood conditions so that, uh, you know, back in Pakistan, there's Mohenjo-Daro, the Bronze Age city that really survives on, on platforms. That's how it, you know, it, because it's all elevated. That's one thing that I'm promoting everywhere to have everything on a, on a raised ground. So this chula or the stove is also uh, on a raised platform. And uh, then suddenly what we find is that women, first of all, it's all clean. So the children are not getting burnt. The woman is not getting sick and you know, there are all kinds of diseases with, I don't know whether you know about this open, uh, or, you know, the uh, open flame uh, stoves uh, that everybody uses in my country and all the rural areas. And then suddenly uh, you found that where she was crouching on the floor, she suddenly now her back is erect as if she's sitting on a throne. It's only earthen throne, but it is. That itself raised her status in society. So I think we have to be thinking about these issues. How do we really create conditions or through architecture, how do we create elements that will really lift their, their status up? That's, that's the most important. And how do you provide dignity? I mean, that's another important aspect. No? Um, so there's still time for questions in the room and online. Please do use the Q&A uh, feature. And I might go for one of those questions um, uh, from Amy, who says, you know, the, the structures look amazing, but how well insulated are they? They seem very open. What would happen in cold temperatures in particular? Well, I think we know that these are very well insulated structures, especially if it's earth brick, then, you know, there's a... a it, Basically, it's, it's a mass kind of uh, that provides the, uh, the insulation that you need. Even in this bamboo structure, when you put the matting on the two sides, there's a void in between that provides insulation. So actually compared to concrete and, and uh, fired brick, these structures are far more, far more comfortable in terms of climate uh, or, or you know, conditions within the, within the room. Uh, I mean, that's why, I mean, in most countries, this is the way people have built. So these were comfortable. We have to see really that now in terms of energy problems and uh, energy poverty in many countries, I think we should really not be building in concrete at all because those are really not the ones that will provide you the insulation that you need. Yeah, and, and it's when you talk about the history of building, you know, many of the buildings in a place like this, particularly the early ones, were natural products. There was stone that was found that we used. And it's relatively recent. We've moved away from that. We've talked about that. Uh, any more questions in the room? Um, I'll do one from online. Um, a brief one from, from uh, M. Reynolds. What is the percentage of women in Pakistan who cannot read? Oh. Do you know the number? Oh, I'd be ashamed to tell you. I mean, in my area that I work in, 99% can't read. Yeah. That is the tragedy. But it doesn't mean they're not smart, okay? Let's not forget, let's not forget that. They may be non-literate. They're very smart. And they just do things like, I cannot tell you. I mean, you, they just run with it. But I think it's got something to do with the women not having had a, the responsibility for, for generations, even every, in every country. So women do work harder to get there. I think this is true for every country. But here in my country, they do even more so because they've never been given a chance. And they're all willing to read and they all want to send their kids to school. And I mean, there's a lot of, uh, how shall I say, inner kind of now strength for them to be able to get ahead. And we need to now capitalize on that and keep them going. Yeah, it's amazing thinking how much we could do. There's a question at the back up there. Um, hello, thank you very much for the um, presentation. It's been very, very interesting and very exciting. So the question I have is, is I judge, is quite keen to learn more about it is from the urban planning point of view so would ultimately those those sort of units be separate or would they sort of come into like bigger agglomerations uh you know just thinking in terms of then you know construction of roads and things like that sort of what what is kind of plan uh from from this point of view i just you know uh, not sure you mean how do you apply the same principles to an urban context so once, once it's kind of built, would it be sort of built near to the other urban facilities, for instance, or would it be kind of separate and, you know? Okay. Well, of course, uh, right now, the areas that have been affected are mostly uh, rural areas where there are large tracts of land and there are villages that are quite further apart. So it's not like a, uh, like a settlement at all, really. 
But of course, uh, uh, we get uh, something like urban flooding, uh, which is terrible now in, in cities like Karachi. And I have a solution for that too. I've done a project, but you have to come to my lecture to hear that next, next Monday. The question at the back. Thank you very much for an absolutely brilliant uh, presentation. Um, you talked about the unfettered consumption of the global north. And I'm wondering um, if you have any advice for the global north, for the UK, even for Cambridge, of how we might wean ourselves off concrete. <laughs> well, that's a, a little bit of a difficult question. You've got me on the wrong foot, huh? Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I think you know all of us can really uh, be a little bit careful how we use the resources. And it's not only true here in Cambridge or in the UK, it's everywhere in the world really, even in my country. Only I think difference is that uh, we say in Pakistan, we try to absolve ourselves to say that we do not contribute the same kind of uh, you know, aggressive missions as you do in the, in the West because of the way the systems are. Because remember that because of the capitalist system and industrialization, you have, uh, you know, their products and their uh, ways of doing things are highly energy consumptive. And I think it's a matter of looking at it, but I have to tell you that I'm very impressed by the Sustainability Institute and uh, John French is doing this audit of uh, carbon and so on. And I think, you know, that's, that's the way to go really to try to see how we reduce all that. Maybe Nick, you have something to say on that? What do you think? I agree. It's a huge problem. I mean, it's really, it's, it's really, really difficult. We've just built, as people in Jesus College know, uh, an underground uh, part of the kitchens, you know, in a historic grade one listed building, a lot of it's underground. The low carbon concrete that you have isn't really, you, you can, it, it's the product of waste material from um, power stations. You can't really claim that's green. So at the moment, building below ground is just not possible without concrete. And there are places you perhaps have to do it. So the only thing you can say is, well, it's the first time we did it for 600 years. If you amortize it across the next 600 years, it's not too bad. <laughs> but one of the lessons from that, I would think the lessons for the West are, and I think this is very, very important, is we have to make sense of what we've got. So demolishing recently constructed buildings, or, or even buildings of the 19th century, um, seductive though it may seem, because we can improve efficiencies and all that sort of stuff, is not on. We've got to find ways of retrofitting. And in a strange way, colleges do that. We tend not to demolish. I mean, I'm afraid 19th century and 1960s, Waterhouse's little, little hall was demolished, but generally we don't now. We try to make sense of historic fabric even relatively recent historic fabric, which in the in the 20th century has very, very high embodied energy. We should not be destroying that. If I can make a little tiny plea at the moment, and I think we've lost this battle, uh, the part of the British Library, which is a grade one listed building, the extension to that to the north is getting planning permission for demolition in order to do a huge commercial building back from which the British Library will rent its conservation department. I mean, that's a disgraceful, I, I wrote a letter of protest and so on, but that is, it's almost unstoppable. Well, it, I think I'm afraid so it is this, uh, I think, uh, is it London County Council or the mayor's office that have come out with a very good document on, on circular uh, economy? And I think they do promote, uh, they do say that it, it's not a good idea to demolish buildings, but better to refurbish them and retrofit them. And I think that's true for everywhere, really, because any new building will have lots of carbon emissions. So we all have to be careful. It's all around the world. I think this is very important for us to understand. So I don't know in the future what architects will do, because you know all these great designs and and all these dreams that architects have to put up these mega structures. Uh, you know, I think there's going to be trouble later on. I suspect. That's why I think everybody should move into the other side. We more to do there, other than you know. The elite. I think we have time for one final question over there. Thank you for your really interesting talk. Um, so you spoke quite a lot about knowledge transfer, specifically at a local level, you know, transferring knowledge out from this particular project. But I'm wondering more about knowledge transfer at an international level. 
Um, I'm from South Africa and um, recently there were some devastating floods in KwaZulu-Natal and Durban and I think it was a similar situation where a lot of you know poorer poorer income communities those houses were really devastated in those floods and I think this sort of Baza um, framework that you have could really work well in a country like South Africa as well that also have a lot of bamboo and you know these sort of things so have there been those more sort of international collaborations and transfer of this of this amazing sort of knowledge that you've developed yes uh yeah well there have been some not not as much as i'd like but there's been some in malawi they're building a um a kind of orphanage with the same kind of bamboo structures and in south africa actually there's a friend of mine who's trying to do the uh my stove the earthen stove she says exactly the same thing because conditions are very similar poverty levels are very high and uh, the uh, settlements are not really worth living in because they're all made out uh, of uh, these galvanized iron sheets. It's impossible to live in them. So I think we need to be all working towards that kind of an issue. That's why I think young architects really need to be involved into communities more somehow. If you could develop a kind of consultancy communities, then you'd be able to do a hell of a lot. Then you'll be able to change the, everything because design is the key issue and they don't have access to design because architects are not bothering to look at them. If architects were to spend some time and engineers and others who are involved with the built environment, you would find solutions for the space, spatial organization, as well as what kind of buildings they should be. So I'm hoping that there are quite a few young people here. I'm hoping they might start doing something. Huh? Good. Well, I think that brings us to the end with that appeal for people to actually do something, um, because I hope this has been the inspirational lecture, I promise. I hope you've seen some brilliant ideas, but I hope it also may have made some of you, particularly those who are sort of starting off a career, I'm seeing some nods, which is good, to think differently about what they do. You know, it'd be lovely to imagine that building construction attitudes of the future could partly be shaped by this conversation we've had here and the wonderful insight, the vision, the passion, the commitment from Yasmin. Yasmin, thank you so very much for being here and for sharing it with us. I'm, let's, let's see how many let's see how many finally come up to pakistan that'll be the, that'll be the... I, won't, I won't ask one says but, but thank you very much for joining us here at jesus college and for the intellectual forum and just before you go we have a lot more to come carrying on with our theme about many things about changing the world social justice and thought so next tuesday we have a a, a huge launch event looking at hacktivism and black creativity with george hofstetter with reddit uh, with, a, with a number of other people. Later that day, online only, we're launching a uh, report with the Global Health Security Network about how we get people vaccinated around the world. And then next Thursday, we have one of the highlights of our year, the Lisa Jardine lecture. I spoke earlier about how wonderful uh, Lisa was, and we do an annual lecture. And this time we have the amazing Nadine Ackerman coming from Leiden to talk about the role of archivists and editors in looking at what we have. So please do come along to that. And if you prefer tech things, do come to that as well. But the next week we have, uh, we're hearing from Britain's former chief cyber negotiator about technology and geopolitics and how that relationship works. And there's much more to come. So I uh, hope to see you at many more of these things. Thank you for being with us. And Yasmin, thank you again for being wonderful. <laughs>